never gonna smoke. I'm never gonna drink. My old man's the preacher, and my pants are pink. Shut up. Again, I'll knock your block off. Well, that's nice talk from a minister's son. Don't you call me that or I'll hit you too. Norman, that is enough. He said I was a sissy. He said all preacher's kids are sissies. You have to prove him wrong in God's house. Anyone calls me a sissy, I'll fight him. I'll fight him anywhere. <laughs> and I don't like God. I don't even believe in him. Then leave his house. I'd talk to that young man in the woodshed, and I'd use a razor strop. Mr. Melton, ladies and gentlemen, please resume your seats. We will continue with the service. Robert, leave your sweater on. Now, there has to be some other place to look. Lana, I am hungry. That isn't my fault. And I won't go near that kitchen until Norman is back in this house. He's out there all alone someplace. Too frightened to come home. We looked all over, even in the mill pond. <sighs> Clifford! All right, Anna, all right. I will go and look for him myself. <sighs> Leonard, come here. Give me that. I said no one eats in this house until Norman is back, and I mean it. But he's back. What? At least he's almost back. So I'm sneaking in the church a couple of minutes ago. <sighs> now, you wait here. I will but, take care of this. What are you going to do to him? That young man has spent all day with his conscience. And you know what a conscience he has. I don't think I'll have to do anything. It wasn't true, God. I do love you. I did turn the other cheek once. Then he hit that one, too. I don't want to criticize you or anything, but I don't think you should have picked me to be a minister's son. I mean, I'm liable to give your church a bad name. You know what you should have made me? A doctor's son. Then when I was bad, what could they do to my father? I mean, well, they couldn't fire him. Does it seem that bad to you, Norman? Being a minister is one of the richest, freest callings in the world. Why? Well, I'm not sure I could explain it to you. If the Lord ever calls you, you'll know. If the Lord ever calls me, I'm not going. I mean, well, God's not going to call on me to be a minister. Well, he's going to make me a, a ball player or a judge or something. But there's one thing I'm never going to be, a minister. Norman, come here.
it up, will you? We got a real beat on this one. Blood and gore all over the floor and you without a spoon. The journal? Hey, uh, he's uh, a oh, reporter. Uh, Take our picture. All right, wipe the brain. Oh. That was good. That's a good shot. Is the murderer still up there? Unless she killed a room full of cops, she is. Unless she killed a room full of cops, she is. All right, now where were you standing when you shot him? Over there where the marks are? Norman, when I take this shot, grab that picture. What? The picture. Murderer and victim in happier times. I'm not going to take that. Oh, no, not again. Okay, Boy Scout. Mommy will do it. Get a good story now. Night, all. See you later, Ev. Get you something? A glass of water? A cigarette, maybe? Why you keep staring at me? This ain't no zoo. This ain't no zoo. I ain't an animal in the zoo. <laughs> okay, lover. Look, page one. Don't pay any attention to him, Harry. He's suffering from uh, remorse. Hey, Charlie, how about a couple of drinks? I'll get him, Evelyn. No, you don't. It's my scoop. I'm buying. Hey, Charlie. Improve your mind. It's a pretty nice piece you wrote for us. Thanks. Well, all the papers had about the same facts. Names, ages, what happened, where. But ours was the only one where the whole scene came alive for the rear. The crowd outside the house, the policemen, the reporters inside, the body on the floor, and the poor forlorn figure of the woman scorned. Nice reporting. I'd say that was as much of a scoop as Evelyn's honeymoon picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Norman, what are you thinking? I'm thinking... that I'm watching children playing in tall grass. And a snake comes slithering through the grass and pauses to strike at the children. Now, what do I do? Do I cry out a warning? Do I stamp the snake to death with my heel? No. I take out my notebook and I describe how it poises there, how it strikes. You're a reporter, not a doctor. Your job is not to cure, Norman. It's to find out and present. And you've got to remember that. But am I going to spend my life writing these miserable stories for people to lap up with their morning orange juice? What good does that do? I keep asking myself, what makes people so afraid? What makes them so cruel, so violent? Because they're bad. Thanks, Evie. Look, lover, you've got to learn that the woods aren't all full of Boy Scouts. There's lions and tigers and bears out there. But who's really good and who is totally bad? There's a dividing line. It, it's called the law. Norman, what was that? I don't know. It shook up the whole place. Well, come on. You're a reporter, aren't you? Let me in. I've got to get a telephone. Let me in. Hey, Mr. Witters, what happened? A building down the street. It blew up.
I'll stay back hey, here, people. Hand over here. The wall's coming down. I'll stay back. My sister, she was in that building. The lady, you gotta keep Move up. those people back. You too, now. Stay back. Grace and the Herald. Oh, come and get me, please. Somebody come and get me. Listen oh. to me, Mary. I can't get to you. This board won't support both of us, but you can come get to me. Get me. Please, all you have to do is crawl on the board. Come on. I can't, I fall. Oh, come and get me, please. Oh, please, somebody come and get me. Mary, don't look down, but listen. Can you hear me? Help me, somebody, help me. There's nobody over there that can help you, Mary, but there's someone with you who can. There's nobody up here. Yes, there is, Mary. God's up there with you. He's holding out his hand. He won't let you fall. I can't. I can't. I can't. Yes, you can, Mary. Now listen, not to me, but to God. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. God's waiting to help you, Mary, but you've got to work with him. He put that board there for you. He meant for you to use it. Mary, believe me, God is there with you. He told you so himself. I am with you always. That means now, Mary. OK, Mary, that's it. Now crawl out on the board, the bridge God provided. It's good and strong and plenty wide. I can't, I can't. Think, Mary, think. If that were on the ground, you could cross it with your eyes shut. Well, close them now. You don't need them. Go, Mary. <laughs> Just say to yourself, with God's help, I can do it. With God's help, I am doing it. God and I are doing it. With God's help, I can do it. With God's help, I am doing it. God and I are doing it. It's inches now, Mary. With God's help, you're doing it. Mary, it's done. You and God have done it. Some preacher. I'm not a preacher. You should be, mister. You sure should be. Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Yes. Detroit? Oh, yeah, yes, I'll accept the charges. Hello, is that you, Norman? Dad, listen. What would you say if I told you that I was going to... What would you say if I told you I was going to be a minister? Hold on. No, no, never mind. You don't have to call me tomorrow. You can tell me in person. I'm going to come home. Right. Bye-bye, Dad. What are you doing? Evelyn, in recognition of our short but sordid association, I will to you my shield and my sword. I had such high hopes for you and me. What? 
I thought of us as a team. Not just on the paper here, but magazines, maybe even a book. Well, then, uh... Your soft heart is perfect for the Sob Sister stories, and with me to push you, we could go right to the top. But now you think you're John the Baptist or something just because a child finally does what anyone with any guts or common sense would have done in the first place. Well, maybe that's why I'm chosen, to remind people that they've got guts and common sense. Don't you give me that chosen stuff. If anyone's chosen, they choose themselves. Evelyn, I may be a nut or a religious fanatic or whatever you want to call me, but there's a little girl not far from here who's alive now instead of dead. There was a power that used me for that job. Now, I don't care if you call that power luck or soft-heartedness or pea soup. I call it God. Pea soup. Anna, Norman's coming home, but he won't get here any sooner if you stand there watching for him. A minister. Norman is going to be a minister. We'll see. We'll see. Now, let's get some sleep. Reverend Norman Vincent Peel. <laughs> Dr. Norman Vincent Peel. Oh. Bishop Norman Vincent Peel. Ha. It's a pity he can never be Pope. Excuse me. Can you tell me where the seminary is? <laughs> right in here. They don't take you if you can't read. What? <laughs> Good luck, Reverend. Not for three years yet, but thanks anyway. <laughs> so it seems obvious that, um, or logical, that when Paul said to the Corinthians, that the Romans, when, when Paul said to the Romans, the, the wages of sin is, is death, that... Uh, he must have been talking about a, a spiritual death. When a, a man lives uh, against the will of God, he, he dies spiritually. Uh, at least that's the way I see it. Let us pray. Yes, indeed, let us pray. Mr. Peel, if I want to watch a dance, I go to the theater. You have two feet, stand on them. And for the love of heaven, in the most literal sense, Look at me just once, as if you believe what you're saying. It is obvious, Mr. Peel, that the elements of Greek are beyond your comprehension. Well, they're beyond my interest. It's the Bible that interests me, and believe me, that's Greek to a lot of people. And let thy grace, thy peace, thy love find within our hearts not merely a resting place, but a springboard to the hearts of all mankind. Amen. I made it. Two years and I finally gave a sermon without falling flat on my face. We shall postpone the awarding of medals, Mr. Peel. We still have one more year to go. No, I can't accept that image of an angry God up there throwing down thunderbolts. The God of Jesus is a God of love. He... Mr. Peel, this is my class. You are here not to question, you are here to listen, to accept, and to answer. Is that clear? I didn't come here to be a scholar. I came here because... because... Go on, I'm fascinated to hear just why you came. Because I heard a call to serve God. But I've got to find my own way to serve Him. Norman, what can I say to you? I admire your boundless youthful vitality, and I put up with your doubts, your questions, and your groping for three years. I put up with them because I believed you were sincerely reaching for something. But in these three years, I've failed to discover what that elusive something is. I appreciate that, sir, but if I'm going to be a minister, I've got to follow my own beliefs, not what somebody else says I should believe. Norman, our objective here at the seminary is very simple. We have to, if you'll excuse the expression of the layman, 
turn out a product, in this case, a minister. Now, just where am I going to send you? What kind of a church can I find for you? If you're ever in Berkeley, come hear me preach. Well, now, it don't seem likely that I'll ever get to California. Well, not Berkeley, California, Berkeley, Rhode Island. But believe me, it's going to be just as sunny, just as warm, and just as beautiful as California. Goodbye, Lake. Goodbye, Reverend. <laughs> ladies happen to be members of this church? We are. I'm your new minister. I'm Norman Peel. You're the first of my congregation I've had the pleasure of meeting. You weren't due till Saturday. Oh, well, this is my first church. I couldn't wait. Now I'd like to get in. Is there a key someplace? Why don't you just try the handle? <laughs> you see how excited I am? Excuse me, I forgot to ask you ladies your names. Mrs. Thompson, Mrs. Elwood Thompson. Essie Collingswood, Miss Essie Collingswood. Mrs. Thompson, Miss Collingswood, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Essie, what do you think? Don't look smart enough to come in out of the rain. And pushy. I love these people. I love Miss Collingswood. I love Mrs. Thompson. I love this town. And I'm going to give them a sermon Sunday they'll never forget. Makes you think I'd miss your first sermon. Oh, that's just it. The Lord sent you as a rescuing angel. I have no sermon. What? Dad, give me some ideas, will you? Just give me a few high points from one of your sermons. I will not. What I should give you is a good swip. Well, what were you doing for three years at the seminary? The seminary doesn't prepare you for anything like this. What can I say to these people? I haven't lived long enough to tell them anything. God loves them, doesn't he? God looks out for them, doesn't he? Remind them of that. Yes. Tell them that. What else is there? First, let me tell you how happy I am to be here in my first pulpit. And of how grateful I am. My, my text this morning is from Psalms 118.24. 
This is the day the Lord hath made. Think of that. This is the day the Lord hath made. And he made it for you and for me. <laughs> so let's rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> but every day is a good day, a day the Lord hath made. It just isn't in his nature to make anything that's bad. When the Lord created the world, he created the firmament, and he created the waters, and he created night and day. And when he was through with his creation, he stepped back and he looked at it and he said, this is good. We have to start every morning of our lives with a belief in the goodness of God, loving human beings, being glad we're alive, being thankful for the work we have to do. But how many of us really live this way? <laughs> I know I don't, not always. We say, oh, I just don't have the ability. I just don't have the intelligence. <laughs> you know, when you hear yourself saying something like that, you should stop yourself and you should say, this is an affront to the almighty God. This is an insult to our creator, saying he made us badly. <laughs> God doesn't make us wrong. We make ourselves wrong. When God made you, he made you right. And he didn't make you weak either. But if you hamper yourself and you pamper yourself with all kinds of fears and timidities, uh, you're going to make yourself weak. I wonder. How many of you here know that old story of the two frogs that fell in a can of cream? <laughs> now they thrashed about in there and they tried to leap out, afraid that they'd drown. But after a while, they were pretty exhausted and they had gotten nowhere. So one of the frogs, well, he just, he just sort of gave up. And he said, well, what's the use of struggling? I'm never going to get out of this can of cream. If I'm going to die, I might as well die peacefully. So he folded his, um, well, whatever it is that frogs have. He folded these and he slid down into the cream and he drowned. But that other frog, he had a different training and a different background. He said, I may not win this fight, I may even die. But if I do, I'm going to go down with all flags flying. I am going to die in the ancient and honorable tradition of frogs. <laughs> well, he got his little legs going, and he got these things going, and he started pumping like pistons. And he pushed against that cream and pushed and pushed and kicked and thrashed around and never gave up. And pretty soon, tired as he was, he began to feel something firm beneath his little legs. And he gave ever much more effort. And he pushed and he pumped those little legs. And pretty soon he had solid ground beneath himself. And he gave a mighty spring, and he leaped out of that can, which had become by now not cream, but solid butter. <laughs> well, that's just a fable, I know, but it might be true. God gives even to the very least of his little creatures such amazing resources of strength, of energy, of capability. This is my first day in my first church. This is indeed for me the day the Lord hath made. But there have been some days in my life that I'm not so jubilant in recalling, days that didn't begin with a feeling of gladness, a feeling of joy. As a matter of fact, on some of these days, I wondered why I bothered to get out of bed at all. But you know, unimpressive 
a candidate as I might have been, the Lord had his eye on me, and he called me to be a minister. And I can remember that day when God spoke to me. It's as clear as a bell, his voice ringing in my ears when he said to me, Norman, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And I give it to you right now. Now, so I stand here before you. I'm new. I'm both shy and I'm brash. I'm full of confidence and I'm scared to death. Be patient. Pray for me. Mr. Snyder, that's what I call preaching. Anybody asked me what I heard this morning, I could tell them. You did all right by us this time, Mr. Snyder. He's able. Yes. Well, how do you feel now? Like it's going to be all right? And I love every one of these people. <laughs> Say, that looks pretty spiffy. <laughs> All right, Anna. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, open it up. Look at the size of it. It must be terribly expensive. Oh. Norman never did know how to save his money. <laughs> Come on, Mom, let's see. You've been holding that five minutes. Well, it's my present, and I can hold it as long as I want to. No. No, sir, I'm going to send it back. That's what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to send it back and ask Norman to use it for train fare. Oh, Mother. Well, you don't know how lonely it gets here with you boys at the university and Norman way off up there in Syracuse. All right, Anna. I'll send him the train fare. All right. But you've made me a promise, and I'm going to keep you to it. You understand? All right. Now, come on, open up. I want to see what it is. It's Norman's new church. Brother, look at the size of it. I always knew he'd have a big church, but I never knew it would be so grand. Well, it's, a, it's a cathedral. Mm -hmm. Can't you just see him standing there in the pulpit in his long black robe? He doesn't wear robes, Emma. Well, if he doesn't, he should. I'll make him one, that's what I'll do. Silk, silk. And I'll, I'll put black velvet down the middle and big sleeves so when he throws out his arms... <laughs> well, why not? Do you expect a man with a church like that to preach in his shirt sleeves? No, sir. Norman's a man of position and stature and dignity. You come about the stove. No, Mr. Duncan. Duncan I... moved. I live here now. Now, look, Buster, take it easy on that furniture or you don't get paid. I don't want to take up any of your time, but let me introduce myself. I'm Norman Peel. Whatever you're selling, I don't want. Seeing that you're new in this neighborhood, I thought maybe you'd like an invitation to come to church next Sunday. University Methodist? Unless, of course, you have a church of your own. <laughs> Mister, have you got the wrong man? My name's Feldman. Sam Feldman. Then you're in luck. There's a beautiful synagogue not six blocks from here. I met the rabbi. He's a great guy. Go see him. We both work for the same boss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and my invitation still stands. You come and visit us anytime. Sure, why not? Shalom. Shalom. You sure do a job. Well, thank you. But I got him. Otherwise, Floyd across the street gets all my business. You know, every time I see a man going about his work with a big smile on his face, I say to myself, now there's a man that believes, don't you? Why not? I got good products. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I mean has faith in himself. The kind of faith that comes from going to church. You're kidding me. No! What do you think, I got time to go to church? You owe me $2.85. 
Supposing I talk Floyd into closing down on Sunday mornings, too, then you both could go to church. I don't get it. Get what? Well, who are you? Are you a preacher? Yep. University Methodist. Oh, it's the first time I've ever heard of a preacher trying to drum up his own business. Well, he's just the man that should. He's the one with something to sell. Yeah. I'll be in again, make a fresh pitch. Good. Right. Oh, what? Well, change. <laughs> If you're hurt, sue him. I'll be your witness. I'm suing him, too. I'm charging him with fraud, criminal negligence, loss of my valuable time, and attempted murder. Hey, listen, Miss You Duffy, listen you... to me. I paid you to fix the brakes, the transmission, the clutch, and that whatever you call that thing. And you did nothing. I did it. Absolutely nothing. I could have killed that man. Oh, wait a minute. Can you see your doctor. Send him the bill. Oh, I'm not hurt. I don't know about my car. Well, how do you know you're not hurt? Sometimes these things don't show up for 48 hours. I had a, an uncle who went around a whole week with a concussion, and he was never the same again. You haven't even got a scratch in your car. Where can I get in touch with you uh, in case I should develop a slight concussion? The Alpha V House, University Campus. Just ask for Ruth Stafford. There's always someone there to take a message. There is. Yeah, up until 10 in the evening. Well, what are you going to do? Oh, uh, could you leave the car? Oh, you're darn right I'll leave it, and this time you're going to fix it. Oh, yeah, I will. I'll take it apart inch by inch. Now, how do I get home? We can get a trolley. May I drive you home, Miss Stafford? Oh, I wouldn't think of it, really. I've already caused you enough trouble. If you should happen to be going my way, though... That's exactly the way I'm going. Got your change. Thank you. Look, I may just uh, drop in sometime. You do that. I'll be looking for you. I suspect you think I have a terrible temper. Yep. But I never like wishy washy people. It's just that I paid that robber two weeks' allowance. I'm sorry, I really shouldn't call him that. He seems to be a friend of yours, Mr. Mr.? Norman Peel. Dr. Norman Peel. <laughs> the doctor's a new title. I kind of like the sound of it. Yeah. <laughs> Syracuse isn't much like Rhode Island, is it? How'd you know I was from Rhode Island? Your license plates. Are you passing through or just visiting? Oh, I think I'll stay for a while. I'm getting to like it here. I think you will, once you get to know the people. There are lots of fun things to do. I was wondering about that. I think I need a change of pace about now. What would you recommend? Well, you could always take a drive in the country, have dinner at one of those quaint little restaurants. There's usually a name band at the hotel if you like to dance. You look as if you did. Well, I, I'm not much of a dancer. <laughs> All good dancers say that. And there's always a movie. Here we are. Of course, students can't date every night, but um, seniors are allowed Wednesdays and weekends, and it just so happens that this term I'm a senior. And this just happens to be Wednesday. <laughs> That's right, isn't it? <laughs> Say, I'll tell you what. Why don't we take one of those nice little drives in the country and we'll have dinner at one of those quaint little restaurants? Oh, no, Dr. Phil, no. I really would feel as if I had sandbagged you. That would be very friendly to a stranger. All right, if you put it that way. Good. I'll pick you up at 5.30. Okay. Oh, no, wait a minute. Better make it 6 o'clock. I have an appointment at the church. The church? University Methodist. I have to meet with my choir director for a few minutes. What kind of doctor are you? I'm the new minister. Minister? Yes. <laughs> it surprises me sometimes, too. Six o'clock? Six o'clock. Well, please don't bother to get out. I can manage. Goodbye, Dr. Peel. It was very kind of you to drive me home. Bye-bye. Six o'clock, then? I am Dr. Peel. I... I'm terribly sorry. I really am very stupid, but 
Today is Wednesday, isn't it? Yes. Oh, I completely forgot I have a date for tonight. I, I guess I got so mad back at the service station that it just slipped my mind. Please forgive me. Oh, I've got to rush. Bye-bye. I'll call you tomorrow, then. Tomorrow's Thursday. Uh, well, I have an exam coming up, and I do have a date Saturday and Sunday. Well, I'll call you anyway. Those little restaurants will still be there next week, won't they? Bye-bye, Dr. Peel. Goodbye, Ruth. Alpha V House. Just a moment, I'll see. Ruth, it's him again. I'm sorry, Dr. Peel. Miss Stafford seems to be out. I surely will. You're welcome. He said to tell you he called. What's the matter with him, anyway? Is he old, uh, dull, a wolf, or just plain repulsive? Let's just say he's someone I could never be interested in. But gee, maybe one of us will be. He can always use a good doctor. He's not that kind of doctor. It's your bit. Well, what a pleasant surprise. Mr. Johnson, Doctor. Mr. Marcus, I expected to have to look all over town for you gentlemen, and here you are. Yes, well, you see, I had to... Uh, no, that is, we had that decided... Ah, here it is. Gentlemen, what about this mortgage that's been hanging over our heads? Well, it's traditional for an old established church to carry a mortgage, Doctor. Yes, but after 20 years of only token payments, ours is getting a little long in the tooth, isn't it? <laughs> now, I have an idea that it just might get us this building free and clear. In just a little while. <clears throat> Some theatrical scheme, no doubt. In a way, yes. Yes, and that's just what I thought. Now, Sam, please No, don't. no, it's time a few of us spoke in some plain English. Dr. Peel, this church is not a circus, and you are not a paid entertainer. Oh, we don't mind you evangelizing to win new members, but just plain vulgar advertising. On my way here today, I saw a series of signs, like those, uh, those... Shaving advertisements. Here. Lost your gal? In a lurch? <laughs> Don't panic, pal. Go to church. And a big arrow was pointed directly at this church. Now, you can't build the house of the Lord on a foundation of the devil. I see. Sam, don't be so black and white. No, 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 that's, that's good. Mr. Marcus, let's talk plain English. When our Lord walked this earth for his three years, he used the best means of communication then known to man. He sat upon a mountainside and he talked. But since that time, God has given us other ways to reach men's hearts. Among these gifts is advertising. In other words, letting people know what you have and where they can get it. Now, I'm not ready to turn this great gift over to the devil. I'm in competition for the hearts of the young people of this university town. I need all the energy, all the, all the originality, all the sense of humor that God has given me. That's the reason for those silly little signs. And that's also the reason for this little idea I have now. Come in, Henry. Where do you want this, Dr. Peel? Set it right down here. Down here. Thank you. You're welcome. In case you're wondering what kind of a devilish vulgarity that may be, it's a ladder. Every Sunday, it lies across the last four pews of the balcony of our church. Since nobody ever sits there, it's the best place to store it. Well, tonight I asked Henry to bring it up here to me. Every time I look at this ladder, I want to say to myself, Peel, 
You better get up off your laurels and start advertising, or you're going to spend the rest of your life at Syracuse preaching to this ladder. I do appreciate this, Mrs. Miller. I'll return them as soon as I can. No hurry, Dr. Peel. Any time we can be of assistance. Thank you. Stafford? Ruth? Oh, I beg your pardon. I saw Miss Stafford. And like Apollo chasing Daphne. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize you, Dr. Peel. Though I'm not a churchgoer, curiosity impelled me to attend one of your services. I appreciated that you had a kind of primitive drive, but I didn't know that you practiced it so recklessly. <laughs> no, I, I, I tremble to think of Miss Stafford's fate were we not here to offer sanctuary. Now, wait a minute, Professor. Just because I'm a minister, don't... Really, Mr. Peel, you've created enough diversion. Would you go quietly and permit the class to return to order? Not until I've apologized to Miss Stafford for embarrassing her. I'm all right, Dr. Peel. Just go. I will. But first, I'd like to tell the learned professor that he was quite right. I was pursuing Miss Stafford, and I intend to keep it up. That is a man's prerogative until he satisfied himself the chase is futile. If men didn't pursue women, this world would be in a sorry mess. No one's ever been able to explain why one person falls for another person. But when that attraction becomes mutual, that's God's most potent chemistry. Maybe his greatest. Be strong, be of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you whithersoever you go. If you believe that, if you practice it, if you yield yourself to it, it doesn't matter what kind of obstacles and difficulties you may face. Recently, I came across a thrilling and remarkable story. Even the title is glorious. By wheelchair to the stars. Now, you wouldn't think you could go to the stars in a wheelchair, would you? But this man did. At 17 years of age, he was totally crippled by rheumatic fever. The mere wearing of his clothes was torture to him. He'd cringe at the flapping of a window shade. So, so tender were his nerve ends. They told him, you're finished. Washed up, useless forever. And at 17 years of age. His parents were poor, so he had to sit around the house all day long in a little crude wheelchair that his father had made for him. Useless at 17, 18, 19, day after empty day. Useless. And that word useless cut into him and hurt him more than his painful body did. He didn't want to be useless. He wanted to do something. He wanted to be somebody, amount to something. One day a friend of his said to him casually, you know, you could make greeting cards. Now, that wouldn't thrill you, would it? But he said he'd try. And he set to work. And after six months, he made one card. And he sold it for a nickel. And just when he thought he was making a little progress with himself, he fell out of his wheelchair one morning. And he lay on the floor trying to get up. But he couldn't. And he squirmed there like a like a helpless little newborn animal. Finally, he heard the mailman at the door, and he called out to him. And the mailman came in and saw him there and lifted him and set him back in his chair again and said, are you all right? But the boy just threw back his head, and he laughed. The mailman looked at him, and he said, Harry, I just don't know where you get the courage. 
And the boy answered him, Well, I don't have much, but what I do have I get from a book where it says, With God, nothing is impossible. The next year, he earned $800 selling greeting cards by mail order. And he took all that money and he made a down payment on 12,000 Christmas cards. His mother said to him, son, what if you don't sell them? What then? But he said, mother, with God, nothing is impossible. Well, he didn't sell those 12,000 Christmas cards. He sold 19,000 Christmas cards. And today he's one of the greatest manufacturers of greeting cards in the entire world. Now, don't think that this story impresses me solely because it's a story about material success. It is that, and it's good. But it's much more than just that. It's proof of what God can do. Proof that when people say, you're useless, you're helpless, finished, through, that you can still find the greatest secret in life, which is that with God, nothing is impossible. Now, Norman Vincent Peale, you listen. Listen to what you just said. And the next time you have a tendency to whine or be defeated by anything, remember that you can go to the stars in a wheelchair. And you out there, you with your, your little troubles, or maybe you've got big troubles, but you listen to this. Because this is a fact worked out in the laboratory of Christian experience. Be strong. Be of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. Practice that. And why can you be sure of it? Because in the glorious last line, the Lord. Now remember this. The Lord, thy God, is with you. Whithersoever you go. Yes, even in the darkest shadows. And with him by your side, you can have courage over all of life. Spread the word around the university. I like to see young faces out there. Hello, Ruth. Good morning, Dr. Peel. If you're not busy, I'd like to talk to you. I uh, feel I should explain why I didn't answer your calls, why I told the girls to tell you I was out. I'm not going to listen to your explanation. Dr. Peel. At least not here on the church steps. We've got a long overdue date for a ride in the country. Would you risk a ride with the wrong kind of doctor? <laughs> You're going to tell me why you didn't answer my calls. There's no point to it. Could you be more specific? I just didn't want to become involved with a minister. Is that all? I was afraid that you were engaged or there was some serious drawback. But why wouldn't you want to become interested in a minister? I don't mean me. I just mean ministers in general. Well, for one thing, I am not the type of girl that a minister should waste his time on. I'd never do for him, he'd never do for me. Why not? I like excitement. I don't want my life to be dull, not for a minute. What else? I like independence, like pretty clothes, 
short skirts are going to be in style. Mine are going to be as short as anyone else. I'm just using short skirts as a figure of speech. Is that all? That's all. Do you want to go straight home, or would you like to stop for dinner someplace? Well, it's a long ride back. You're probably hungry. I've never been so hungry in my life. I hope I didn't offend you by what I said about ministers. You didn't say anything at all about ministers. You just told me what you wanted out of life, and I agree with you. I like excitement. I certainly like my independence. Good night, Dr. Peerlin. Thank you. Norman, please. Oh, look, I meant what I said about ministers. I just can't see me. I tried to tell you what I'm like. Bill Charleston, Charleston. You see what I mean? Ruth, Wednesday night's still dating night, isn't it? I'll be here at 6 o'clock, OK? is that it's the last time we'll be decorating Alpha Phi for a dance. What are you wearing tonight, Ruth? I'm not going. Not going? Well, you haven't missed a formal since we came to school. Not even the time you almost had pneumonia. I know. I never thought. A minister isn't allowed to dance, is he? What makes you think I'm going out with Dr. Peel? Well, now, who else would it be? He's the only one you've dated since Christmas. To miss the formal. Ruth Stafford, have you been holding out on your own roommate? Are you engaged? Of course not. Uh -huh. Oh, it's just that I can't. Well, it's the last chance I have to see him before graduation. Do you realize that I'll never see him again after next week? Very well, say, so leave here without saying goodbye, can I? Oh, Alma, come on. Stop sitting there staring at me like that. I thought it was a fine movie. I haven't cried so much in a long time. You know, there's something about a spring dance. A soft night like this, and music. Boys all shined up and the girls in those long party dresses. Come on. Where? I haven't heard a band like that in a long time. Do you know that this is our first date where you haven't had to rush home for a curfew? We've been given a gift of time. We might as well use it. I'm 
dead. <laughs> I don't understand this. Doesn't it ever bother you that you had to give up exciting things like dancing? Does it bother you? Well, I haven't given up dancing. <laughs> you have since we've been going together. Oh, but it's not the same thing. I haven't given it up for good. I couldn't. How can you? <laughs> because dancing just isn't that important. I've got so much else instead. You want to know something stupid? All my life I've been saying, when I graduate, when I start teaching, when I'm finally out on my own, and all of a sudden here it is, and I don't believe it. <laughs> In three days, I'll be gone. Now, Miss Syracuse, Alpha Phi, and you. You know, I used to to laugh at people who, who would cry at weddings and graduations and things like that. I don't seem to be laughing anymore. I'll linger on, sweet flower of youth. Thou art so beautiful. <laughs> See what this night's done to me? I'm quoting poetry now. Picked the wrong time for it. No girl is that beautiful when she's crying. You are more beautiful tonight than you were yesterday. Yet not as beautiful as tomorrow you will be. I don't even want to think about tomorrow. Scared? You shouldn't be. Tomorrow's a maid for people just like you. People that really know how to live every moment of their lives, and you do. I saw that in your face the first time that you ran into me in your car. And I've seen it ever since. You just can't hide a thing like that. It's like, like sunlight. Every time that we walk along the street and pass a child, you, you reach out to it. Every time we see something beautiful, you you hold it up to me, as if God made it just for the two of us. You really look at life. You hear it. You, you feel it. You're not afraid to laugh, and you're not afraid to cry. What a lucky man I've been to share this world with you. I, um... I think I ought to go in. I'm not very good at saying goodbye. Miss Stafford. May I have this dance? A minister's not supposed to dance? In public. But I'm alone now with my girl. Norman, I'm not your girl. I don't want to be a minister's girl. One dance, then. Not with a minister, but with me. Norman, I'd never make a minister's wife. I haven't asked you yet. Then ask me, please. Ruth, I love you. Norman, look. Someone sent me flowers. What do you know? 
Ruth, I don't understand it. The honeymoon's over, but I still love you madly, Norm. <laughs> <laughs> you phoned this in from the lake? Uh -huh. Oh, that woman at the florist talks. She's going to tell everyone she knows. <laughs> mm. Oh, I love you. And I love this house. And I love the town because it loves you so much. What's the matter? Ruth, we're, we're going to leave here. It was a hard decision to make because I love this place too, but I've accepted another pulpit. In a few months, we're going to New York. New York? The Marble Collegiate Church on Fifth Avenue. That's one of the oldest churches in the country. <laughs> yes, I know. I've done a lot of praying about it. I think it's what God wants. Means your work is finished? The debt is paid, the church is filled every Sunday. Ruth, you want to go? <laughs> of course I do. Oh. Norman, it's a challenge. Yes, it certainly is. You don't think I'll flop? Flop? What's all this confidence you're talking about? You're not a fraud, are you? I certainly hope not. <laughs> Am I so funny? No. I was just laughing at myself. Remembering when I thought that life would be dull married to you. Everything you need, it's a long trip. You go get Dad. I'll take care of John and Elizabeth. I can take care of myself, Mom. Me too. Now listen to me. For the next couple of days, we can't bother Daddy. You hear? What's the matter? What are we going to do? We're going to Grandma's. We're going to visit Grandpa. But it won't be like the other times. Grandma, Grandma won't be there this time. Johnny, you want to get the door? Okay.
I can't speak the words that I prepared to say today. They were gloomy words that sprang from my sorrow. Now my heart is too full of understanding. Our mother hasn't left us. In our hearts, we know that. We don't try to prove immortality because we want to believe it. We try to prove it because we can't help believing it. If a baby not yet born could think, he might say, oh, this is a warm place. I'm taken care of. I'm secure here. I like it. He'd look upon the process of birth as if it were death, because it would mean the end of the state that he was in. And he'd say, I don't want it to end. What to us is life is to him death, and he resists it. But soon the day comes when he does die to that world and is born into this life here. What happens to him? He's cradled in loving arms. Soft hands touch him and hold him gently. A kind face looks down on him, and he loves that face. Soon he begins to grow and to love life. Oh, he has some hardships and some struggles which toughen his fiber. But he learns to love God, and people love him. Finally, he's an old man. And He's told you have to die. He protests, I don't want to die. I love this world. I like to feel the, the sun on my face. I love to hear the whisper of the rain. I don't want to die. But he does die. And he's born into the next world. Can we believe that all of a sudden the character of God and the nature of the universe will change so that he'll be born into a place of terror and gloom or that he'll suffer complete extinction? No. That person will awaken to find himself young again. Loving faces will greet him and loving hands will reach out to him. More beautiful sunlight will fall on his face and sweeter music will sound in his ears. And he'll say to himself, why was I so afraid of this thing that we call death? When as I now know, it is really life. <laughs> and that time you bought her the diamond ring from the 10 cent store, remember, Dad? Your mother always wanted to believe the unbelievable. It never occurred to her that I'd have had to rob a bank to get her a real ring that size. <laughs> you know, there was a time when I used to think that laughter after a funeral was sacrilege. Well, it isn't. It means that someone, well, like your mother, has given us a wonderful legacy. Yes, that's Memories right. of good things. But there's one memory that none of you can share with me, and that's the memory of your mother when we were first married. Young and, and eager, filled with wonderful ambitions for the children she wanted to have. Oh, uh, what's all this? Mama, you've got to do something about John. He won't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You're having a party down here, and I don't want to listen. John, over here on my knee. This I'll minute. give you five minutes, and that's all. We are not having a party. We are having a serious discussion. That's all we do at home is talk. Dad knows more words than anybody. <laughs> Johnny. That's because he's a minister. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, young man. Your grandmother always wanted you to be a minister, too. Not me. That's something I'm never going to be, a minister. Sometimes it's bad enough being a minister's son. <laughs> <laughs> does that sound familiar? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Your mother was pleased when you went into the ministry, Norman, but I don't think that was the plan she had for you. Now, she always knew when Bob was born that he'd be a doctor and that Leonard would be a minister like me, but you were a puzzle to her. I think she had more in mind for you a writer. He is. Norman's written a book. All right, kiddies, now it's time to be getting along Well, together. now, you see what she's... Your mother always told me that she had a seventh sense about her children. Yes, yes, Norman is a writer of a book that nobody wants to publish. No one? What do you mean, no one? One publisher turned it down, another one's reading it right now. 
Oh, Ruth, he's reading my book because he's a member of my congregation. Norman, that is not the reason. Can I get in a family argument and ask what the book is all about? I bet it's a mystery. Oh, no, the only mystery about this book is why I ever started it in the first place. You know, I can get up and I can talk my head off. But if I have to sit in front of a blank piece of paper with a pencil in my hand and try to put something down on it, oh, I'm scared to death. Come on, tell us what it's all about. What is it called? It's called The Power of Positive Thinking. Oh, brother, that's a mouthful. Uh, you can chew on that title. <laughs> yes, and I hope some publisher is going to find the rest of it equally worth the chewing. I read this very carefully. Believe me, I did. And I like what you said. But my company publishes religious books. But Tom, this is a religious book. This shows people how to apply the power of God in their daily lives. Everything I've learned is in this book. Look, there are a thousand men in New York City who can write, but there's not one who can preach a sermon the way you can. All right, Tom, I get the idea. Thanks for your trouble. Well, I mustn't keep you people from dinner. I wish I could do something more. Oh, I understand. You know, Doctor, publishing is business. Of course it is. Good night. Good night, Tom. Good night, Mrs. Peel. Good night. Norman, it's perfectly ridiculous. You'll find a publisher, I know you will. Oh, he's right. I'm no writer, I'm a preacher. I've got work to do, important work. I can't waste any more time on this. Don't touch that. That's where it stays. Honey, I mean it. You are not to take this out of the wastebasket. That is a manuscript? Yes, it's a little hard to explain. I'm sure. Now, why don't you go to one of the recognized agents? Last Thursday, I heard Mr. Boardman speak, and I believe he said a publisher has the duty to bring out books that are for the public's good. He does, but there are channels we just have to follow. A man like Mr. Boardman has a schedule. I know about schedules. My husband has one, too. But I also know that there are odd moments in the day, and that's all this will take, just one of those little odd moments. I can't. Rules are rules. I'll just have to wait until Mr. Boardman comes out. Very well, if you've nothing better to do. And you don't mind making yourself slightly ridiculous. I don't mind. Nothing else on the calendar, is there, Mr. Trail? No, Mr. Boardman. Mr. Boardman, please. Oh, there is something else. It'll only take a moment. This is Mrs. Peel. I tried to persuade her not to wait. This is my husband's book. For reasons I'd rather not explain, it had to be delivered this way. Who did Miss Crail tell yes. you? Yes. Yes, she did, Mr. Borman. But please, just for once, break the rules. Read this book. This is my telephone number, and you call me when you finished it. help you? Yes. Please, do you have the uh, power of positive thinking by Norman Vincent Peale? <laughs> Under both hands. <laughs> well, in that case, I'd better take both of them before you run out. Uh, cash or charge? That'll be cash. Now, on second thought, I think I'll take a third one while they're still in stock. Don't bother to wrap them. Uh, excuse me. Is it really that good? It's a wonderful book, a little spicy, full of spice. But don't take my word for it. Why don't you find out for yourself? Let me make you a gift. Oh, thank you so much. We are two more bags. Oh, no, no, give them to her. No, 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 I can't take them. Give them to her. Good morning, Dr. Peel. Good morning. Here are your appointments for the rest of the day. Thank you. 
Six months after we published the first copy of The Power of Positive Thinking, I felt that, well, maybe 15 or 20,000 copies would make a good sale. But now, here we are, not 15 or 20,000, but 500,000 copies later, and still going strong. I wasn't using positive thinking. <laughs> All right, who has the first question? Rod Allenberry, Akron Press. What do you call this approach of yours? A method, a philosophy, a system, or just what? No, it's just plain Christianity. What's in my book is exactly what I've been trying to say ever since I've preached my first sermon. Could you hold up the book while you talk, Dr. Peel? Yes, of course. This is a guide, a road map, you might say. And there's nothing I've invented in here. It's all written right there in the Bible. It's stated again and again. Together, God and you can do anything. I have a question on that topic, Dr. Peel. The statement... Identify yourself, please. Name Michaels, the Eternal Faith magazine. The statement you made that you and God can do anything, isn't that blasphemy? The God for whom the mighty King David bowed down in fear and trembling is not here to do what you want at the snap of your fingers. Well, I certainly never applied You that. are a dangerous man, Dr. Peel. You are preying on all the paganistic dreams of this world. Greed, power, money. Miss Michaels, you're completely out of line. God is my line. But he's an avenging God to those who would use him for their own selfish purposes. Miss Michaels. I want an answer. If you'll be quiet for a minute, I'll give you an answer. Why don't you sit down and give the man a chance to talk? Don't any of you see what he's doing? Yes. John Hallman of the Christian Adherent. Though Miss Michaels expresses herself perhaps too emotionally, Dr. Peel, there's great concern among the leaders of religious thought that you have reduced God to the status of a servant, there to do what you want when you want it. I don't say that at all. I merely state that man is not a helpless creature born to frustration and failure. And that God had darn well better not let you fail. Mr. Hallman, we didn't intend for this to become a debate. Now, if you have a question, please state it. Very well. Dr. Peel, is it the Lamb of God you worship, or is it the golden calf of success? Mr. Hallman, you're out of order. General, please. What is this, some kind of a nightmare? Have I ever preached these things they're accusing me of? Have I ever said that you could use God to get what you want? I don't think I've ever preached anything but what's in the Bible. Norman, what you believe in is right. This criticism is vicious and unfair. You can't let it upset you. Oh, I know, I know. I've always warn people about not letting resentment cloud their thinking and now look at me i'm getting hurt and well, angry then stop it norman i love you too much to see this happening to you it's eating away all your strength oh but ruth these people are not crazy fanatics these are some of the most respected theologians in this country they say i'm a menace to my congregation to my church to mankind at large why I've got to find out why. How do you do, Dr. Peel? You should know, sir. Sit down. Tell me, why have you contacted me? Bishop Hardwick, you're a man I greatly respect and admire. And to put it simply, I'd like to know what you have against me. Well, my first impulse is to make the conventional reply that I've nothing against you personally. But that wouldn't be true. It's impossible to separate you from your doctrine. Peel and positive thinking have become part of the current idiom. And you think that harmful? I've said so publicly. 
Did you expect me to recant because we're meeting face to face? You occupy the pulpit of the oldest continuous Protestant pastorate in this country. With that pulpit, you inherited a great tradition, a sacred trust. I humbly agree. Humbly? Do you deny that you stand in that pulpit Sunday after Sunday and preach your own version of Christianity, a new religion? I certainly do deny that. Examine yourself, Dr. Peel. Haven't you sought the spotlight? Haven't you enjoyed being the best-known minister in America? Now, I've said publicly that I deplore the easy kind of Christianity you've made so attractive. Now, I say privately that I suspect you, Dr. Peel. I suspect your motives. <laughs> Give me an answer, Lord. I'm so tired of arguing, tired of fighting. Have I become proud? Do I need to have my spirit tempered? Only you know how to temper a man, Lord. I'm not going to question your judgment. I saw him. I'm going to resign from my pulpit. I've got to do it. I have to get away from this church, away from everything, if I'm going to think, and I have so much to think about. I'll write up my resignation tonight, and then I'll read it tomorrow in church. It's going to seem funny without all those speeches to make, all those pressures. Maybe I'll just get a little parish someplace and, and we'll have time, time for the kids, and time to go fishing, time to really enjoy ourselves. Why don't you say something, Ruth? Another Ruth said it for me. Whither thou goest, I will go. This is Norman Peel. This is Mrs. Arthur Gordon. My husband is Dr. Gordon of Mercy Hospital. I need you desperately. 772 Central Park South. <laughs> Mrs. Gordon? It... Well, when do you want to see me? Now, please. Well, I guess if I needed your husband at 4.30 in the morning, he'd come. I'll start right away. Thank you for coming. I'm Arthur Gordon. My wife is upstairs with Marianne, our daughter. Marianne has been in a coma for four days. Tonight, some of the finest medical minds in the country confirmed what I already knew. She's going to die. But my wife refuses to accept that fact. How about you? Dr. Peel. I let her call you because I thought you might be able to help her, not because I believe you can help my girl. Dr. Peel. Mrs. Gordon. I had no right to call you. We've never been a religious family. I don't even know how to pray. Dr. Peel, in your book, 
You said there's healing in divine power. I've got to ask you, do you really believe that? Yes. I believe it. Then please, teach us to pray. She loved the sun. Thank you very much. Why are you thanking us? It's a long, long story. Dr. Peel, you believe everything you wrote in that book? Yes. Well, I've got to tell you, even after what happened, I can't. I don't. Oh, but I do, Dr. Gordon. I do. There's one favor you could do for me, Doctor. Would you lend me a necktie? I'm sure there's no one here today who is unaware of the controversy that has been raging in the newspapers, the magazines, and church journals. The issue is whether my beliefs and my preaching are in harmony with the Gospels. Some of the finest minds in the clergy believe, and believe sincerely, that I am bringing reproach, if not actual discredit, upon my calling. If this is true, then I have but two alternatives. The first is to change my message and my methods. But this I cannot do for the simple reason that I believe in them both. The second is to withdraw myself as an object of controversy. 
to resign not only from the pulpit of this church, but from the ministry. It seems strange after so many years of telling you what I believe and try to follow in my own life, that I should be called upon to defend these beliefs as if I had invented them, when there is not one that doesn't come from the greatest teacher who ever lived and who still lives. I believe that every individual is meant to be what God would deem a success. Now, if this word success means the amassing of money or fame to some people, I am sorry. It does not mean that to me. And it certainly doesn't mean that to God. A successful person is merely an integrated, loving, creative individual who lives in harmony with himself and his God. Now, if there's anything wrong in being that, I fail to find it. There are entirely too many people in the world today who are being defeated by the everyday problems of life. They struggle through with a dull feeling of resentment at the bad breaks they're getting. Well, there may be such a thing as bad breaks, but there is a spirit and a method for overcoming these breaks. The spirit is God. The method, well, you can call it whatever you want. I call it positive thinking. Now, by this, I don't mean that you just ignore all the hardships and all the tragedies of the world. Quite the contrary, you face every problem of daily life, but you seize control of it. You don't let it control you. Now, is this idea contrary to the scriptures? I could name you dozens of passages from the Bible that would support what I've just said. But there is one now that comes to my mind more salient than all the others. It is from Philippians 4.13. Now listen to this, because this is one of the greatest statements ever made in the history of mankind. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if you will hold that idea in your mind and let it live within your heart, then you can have triumph over all your weaknesses, all your sins, and all your fears. But in the final analysis, it isn't theology. It isn't religious theories or schisms or isms or any of these things that really matter. What matters is people. God thinks people so important that he gives us authority over all other creatures. He is giving us authority over an ever-expanding part of his universe. And he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son to suffer degradation, insult, and death so that we may live as we are meant to live, not as a weakling, but as a person, a person with a giant in him. You are a child of God. Live that way. With true humility, yes, but with the dignity of your own importance. For that giant in you is the power of God. Shall I leave this church? For many days I have suffered and prayed over that question. But this morning the answer was given to me. It was given to me in a way so glorious, so perfect that I can't tell it to you now without 
bursting with emotion. Perhaps later. But now I have my answer. For as long as God needs me, I'll remain in this wonderful calling. For as long as you want me, I'll remain in the pulpit of this great old church. I'm so proud of you. It's not going to be any picnic. Who wants life to be a picnic? I told you a long time ago I'm the kind of girl who wants excitement. You never know what it's like to have that small congregation. I know what it would be like. I won't have time to go fishing. You hate fishing. And I'll never have that extra time for you. I married a very special man. He's like the magic fountain. The more I share him with others, the more I have for myself. There's an office out there filled with people. Let them wait. You can't. Let them wait. I haven't seen my girl since last night. I never got to kiss her goodnight or good morning. Good morning, darling. Good morning, darling. <laughs> 